Welcome to BizeMag podcast launched by Business Strategy e-magazine and Le Strategic Advisors. Myself, Dr. Vanita Agarwal, CEO and founder of these two companies. Before I start today's episode with uh, our guest, I'll humbly request all of my audience to please subscribe our channel, YouTube channel and BizeMag podcast which is available on Apple, Google Podcast, Spotify, and so many others. You can find it on Google search. So today our guest is Mark Ivanovsky, and he is going to talk about why startups fail. Welcome, Mark, to Bizemag Podcast. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. I look forward to our discussion today. Hopefully some of these insights will help your listeners improve their likelihood of having a successful venture. Sure. So I'll introduce Mark for my audience. Mark is a three times successful entrepreneur with all three exits to Fortune 500 companies. He was Oracle's global CIO, where he helped take Oracle into the cloud SaaS business. And when he acquired over $30 billion in it, in the tech companies, also a managing director with a leading Silicon Valley venture capital, Trident Capital. And currently he is doing strategic consulting, mentoring with startups and tech companies where he has helped guide companies like Ekarna, Nasdaq, Kern in the cannabis software compliance world. And previously Virgin Galactic, where founder Richard Branson just flew into space last week, as uh, some of my audience must be knowing. And today's, as I already mentioned, title of our talk is Why Startups Fail. And Mark Ivanovsky is going to share his expert views and his experience with uh, all of you. So Mark, uh, I will uh, first, you know, naturally ask about this. Why talk, talk about reason for the failures versus reasons for the successes? Generally, everybody talks about, you know, how to make startups successful. And you're talking about why startups fail. Yeah, that's an important point, uh, Dr. Agarwal, if, you know, because if you look at, at least from my personal experience, uh, we learn so much more from something that didn't work than we do from things that do work. It's just the psychology of humankind, I guess. Uh, and so I always try to focus on the things that, you know, cause a startup to have challenges and then help the entrepreneurs to avoid those things, right? And by doing that, you still don't have certainty of success, but you increase your probability of success, uh, you know, significantly if you just follow some of those basic premises and principles. Uh, and so that's why, you know, I'm I'm an optimist in in nature, having been an entrepreneur myself and an investor, but. You know, the, the thing that's very important is to think about the things that would cause it not to be successful, which is harder for the brain to wire to and, and think that way. Um, and so, you know, I like to really focus on those things. And then, like I said, you know, help help the, uh, the startups, the entrepreneurs to avoid those types of issues. Yeah, I think that's very important to, if we say the checklist and strike off the negative points, it automatically takes your startups to success. So what are, the, what are some of the top reasons that you can share that the startups fail and what can be done to increase likelihood of the success? Yeah, that, well, you know, the overriding issue uh, tends to be the startup runs out of capital before they reach cash flow positive status, right? And, you know, the, the reality, though, is you have to ask those underlying five why questions, you know, to get to the root cause of why they've run out of capital, right? Why that happens. Uh, and so I'll, I'll talk through some of the, the key points in history my personal experience, I've got a lot of scars on my back 
from having, uh, you know, made some of those mistakes along the way. And I just hope to help the audience here to avoid some of those uh, so that they increase their probability of success, recognizing this is a very hard thing to do because uh, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Um, so, um, you know, there's really three primary areas that, um, uh, you know, these issues fall into. One is the team related issues, another are market related issues, and then the third is just overall execution. And if you, if you categorize them into those three categories, uh, you quickly see uh, what, you know, some of them are very logical, some of them make a lot of sense, and some of them are surprises to entrepreneurs that they are the cause for failure. So I'll, I'll try to talk through all of all three of those areas. Uh, and please, you know, if you have questions along the way, please do interrupt me or you know, if you have some other thoughts, uh, you know, happy to respond to those as well. Sure, uh, Mark, but please share some more, uh, more on this. Yes, yeah. So let me start with the team issue areas. Uh, you know, the, 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 there's several issues here that tend to drive why a startup may not be successful. The biggest one is there just are no strong entrepreneurs on the team. And, and what I mean by entrepreneurs are, you know, an entrepreneur by definition is a risk taker, but it has to be knowing when and how to take a prudent risk because just taking risk in and of itself is, is not the right answer. You have to really understand, you know, to be successful in a business, any business, whether it be a startup or a, or a large business, you have to have, take a certain amount of risk but it's managing those risks and taking prudent risks that are most critical. And, and to that same point, you know, the team really needs to have the training and the education uh, because without that experience and, you know, first time startups always have that conundrum of, uh, well, we're first time entrepreneurs or we're first time startups, you know, and we don't have the experience. Well, hopefully they can gain from the knowledge of things they can find through uh, opportunities like you know you provide through your services uh, and and you know this uh, discussion directly, um, but you know you have to have a way to develop that experience. Otherwise, you have a very high probability of failure. And it's really about you know they don't know what they don't know. And it's getting to know <laughs> those things uh, in a way where they can avoid, again, the pitfalls of why a startup might not be successful. Uh, you know, one example of this is a single founder, right? It's very rare, and statistically speaking, this is true, very rare that a startup as a single founder is successful. And you ask yourself, well, why is that? Well, that founder doesn't have others to bounce ideas off of to, you know, to think out loud and, and have, you know, alternative points of view brought to bear on an approach taken. And, you know, you have to have a team with a common vision um, for that startup to be successful. Um, another, you know, team issue is, you know, half-hearted attempts. You really shouldn't start a startup if you really aren't really committed to making that startup a success because by definition you know others are putting their heart and soul and everything into making the startup a success and if you're half-hearted about it your probability of success goes way down uh, and and the last team issue you know, is lack of confidence. You know, if you if you as an entrepreneur, your team is aren't confident, you know, who will be right in your offering, and particularly when you're going to raise capital or you know bring customers in, you have to show confidence, but you don't want to do it in a way where you're over exaggerating either. So you have to be credible but confident, you know, in the approach that you're going to take. So, you know, those are sort of the team related issues. 
Uh, let me let me talk next maybe about some of the market issues um, that come into play. And again, please jump in if you have any thoughts or questions. I'm happy to respond to them as well. Sure, sure. Uh, so on the market side, you know, <laughs> I, I'm an engineer. I can stereotype myself a little bit. Early in my career, you know, um, and this is true of most engineers or many at least, they think they know what the customer wants and they go build it without ever talking to their target customer base. They spend the time, the effort, the money to build it. And then they find out, oh, that's what I wanted, but that wasn't really what the customers wanted. And it's, it's, it's a classic trait of a technologist that they tend to think they know. So one of the things I'd really emphasize with uh, particularly first time entrepreneurs is they have to get out early and spend at least half their time talking to prospective customers and getting their feedback even before they build the product, even before they start. And as you get into the financial side of that, you don't wanna be spending any more than half your time on building the product. You wanna be spending the other half of your time or the team's time early on in understanding what the customers really want. Because when you don't do that, you have that outcome that I talked about a minute ago, which is the disappointment of finding out that you as an individual who thought you knew what the market wanted was not what the market wanted. And, and the corollary to that, uh, Vanita, is the not understanding the competitive landscape. You, you, you also have to know what your competitors are doing. Uh, you know, invariably I'll see presentations uh, and after a presentation, and I see, you know, hundreds of them, uh, you know, over very short periods of time. So, you know, I build a, um, a filtering mechanism or a pattern recognizer. And what I'll do after a, a call is I'll go put five keywords into, uh, from their presentation into a Google search. And they've said, we're unique. Nobody else has what we have. And then I find, ah, not quite true. And if that happens, uh, their credibility really takes a hit because it tells me as an investor that they really haven't done their own homework, that they really don't understand what they're up against in the marketplace. So it's deadly to not know what your competition is doing. Uh, and, and very important to be able to differentiate from that. And I'll talk about that you know, in, in the subsequent uh, part of the discussion here on what you know, a, a venture capital investor looks for. And that is a big one, understanding a disruptive business model uh, that uh, really is a game changer from how the competition is attacking the market. So uh, there there comes the, my, my question. What are the basic issues that uh, venture capitals are looking for? Yeah, there, there's, there's several of them. And I've kind of touched on a couple of them already, uh, Vinita. One is, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, the uh, experience of the team, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of the others here uh, in a second, uh, that there's a large, fast-growing market, uh, and it has to be a large, fast-growing market with strong gross margins. And interestingly enough, I find with some entrepreneurs, they're not even clear on what a gross margin is all about, but it's the difference between what you sell the product for and what it costs for you to deliver that product to the customers. Uh, and the reason the gross margins need to be, you know, greater than 50, 60 percent is if they're not, if it's more of a service business, they're typically 20, 30 percent gross margin businesses. And you just don't have enough um, margin for error uh, and, and from a cash flow generating standpoint to, to be able to build a venture backable business. Now you can build a, a very successful service business. There's lots of them out there, but they tend to not be the kind of businesses that venture capital firms look for. Uh, and what they look for is companies that have or offerings that are very disruptive. I always go to the Uber example. You know, Uber became the largest taxi cab company in the world without owning a single taxi cab. Right, and they totally disrupted that marketplace. 
Um, and, you know, they did it through software, right? And, and um, so having the ability to disrupt and be very differentiating in the marketplace is, you know, the other key element there. And then a fourth, fourth is you have to have a agreement on what the value uh, of the company is going to be. So the key valuation metrics come into play uh, when it gets beyond those first three, you know, cutting items uh, that uh, define why a venture capitalist investor will invest in the company. And, uh, and uh, I'll, you know, let me drill into the a little bit more on a couple of these next issues here. Um, having a viable market, um, you know, you really got to do your homework to ensure that there is a large addressable marketplace um, and it's fast growing because, you know, if you're, if you're particularly, you know, you can build a successful mom and pop company without venture capital and service companies tend to be more of that. Uh, but if you're really looking for venture capital investment, they're looking to have a huge multi-billion dollar exit and they have to believe that they're going to make at least a 5X return on their capital. They know they won't make it on all of them, but they have to believe they can going in uh, for any of their investments. And they have to be very large in scale because they are putting a large amount of capital to work typically um, uh, you know, to build that kind of a business. So there has to be a large viable market. Uh, and you know, it's um, uh, you know, marginal niche markets um, that aren't go that aren't that are are can be successful startups, but they're not again the kind of company that a venture capital firm is looking for uh, because they need that size uh, to really be able to drive the returns for their investors, um, you know, into the marketplace. Um, now. You know, the next point, and this is, a, this is a really interesting one, right? By definition, all startups are derivative ideas in some sense. They're a derivative of other things that have been done before. But it's very rare that small tweaks to an existing product are going to be successful. They have to be game changing. They have to be disruptive, as I was talking about. They have to be differentiating, right? The two Ds, as I call it. Um, and they can't just be small tweaks because, you know, you're competing against much larger players typically in that case. And it's very hard, you know, to take on the Goliaths directly and win those battles. Um, you know, that being said, all large companies these days, as a company grows in size, they become less uh, innovative. And, you know, I can speak uh, from my personal experience of being with large firms. They reach a point where they realize because risk taking becomes more difficult as you become a massive multi-million dollar company that their better way to innovate is to acquire like we were doing at Oracle. Um, you know, and Oracle continues to do to this day. Um, so, you know, you need, you need the innovation in the startup uh, and then the buyer is the player that typically is the large player that has market share, like an Oracle, a Microsoft, uh, those types, Googles, those types of players that are going to acquire the new innovation as opposed to develop it themselves. Um, and another market issue is, you know, the lack of competitive advantage. It comes right back to knowing your competitors. Uh, you get, you know, that you've got to have an advantage over them. Uh, in some form, or you're just going to be considered a me too, and then you're going to be fighting the battle of being lower cost, which is not a battle that you want to have to play, particularly as a startup, because you don't have the scale to win the game of being the low cost producer. You need to have differentiation. Hopefully that kind of makes sense, uh, Vanita. Any, any questions there or I'll continue on some other market issues if not. Yeah, please continue. I'm learning a lot from you, uh, <laughs> I must say. And the conversation is really interesting. Uh, and I, you know, I was counting what are the tips that you have given so far. So uh, <laughs> one must take calculated risk, 
one must do proper market research before jumping in one must have a usp to sell the product and be different in comp in this competitive market in order to attract investors then one should be very dedicated and passionate about their startups because you know until you put in your blood and sweat uh, there are so many other competitors in the market so i think i was able to count some of them well you you're a very good listener dr agarwal <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, so please uh, so talk to me let me let me talk on a, on a few others. Uh, that was a great summary, by the way. Um, uh, so some other market issues, just not keeping up with the market. You know, we're we're living in a time where the rate of change of knowledge is exponentially growing, uh, and you know there are those futurists that are contending that we're going to reach an infinite rate of knowledge in our lifetimes which means we'll know everything there is to know about everything. Now that sounds kind of exaggerated, but the point is things, everything's speeding up. I did a talk not too long ago in Europe and under that title. And you know, if you look at technologies and how fast they're being brought to market in the timeline from introduction to full scale implementation is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So you have to be able to keep up with that. Your product can't fall behind. You may have a great product today, but a year from now, you may be overtaken by others that have come up with the next best thing. True. So you have to stay ahead of that. And the other, the other tie back to that is market timing. You can be too soon to a market, and I'll talk about that in a second, or you can be too late. The too late is kind of obvious. You know, if others are already there, well, um, you know, you uh, probably aren't going to be successful, but you can also be too soon. And if you go back to look at the 2000 time frame, um, you know, there were many of the ideas brought to the table then that did not get traction because the technology of the cell phone and the speed of the internet and all of those things just was not there yet. Yeah. The ideas were being brought to the table, but they weren't successful. And then as the technology caught up, they became very successful seven, eight, 10 years later. Uh, so, you know, you can be too soon. And so you have to find that right point where you enter where your product is going to have the right uh, building blocks behind it uh, and be there within a matter of, you know, 18 to 24 months of when you first are going to market. That's about the right point. Uh, to be in that timeline chain. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, another another key point is value proposition. Um, you know, and this gets also into the pricing, this point of view, right? You have to know how to price your product where the buyers, the customers are gonna be convinced that the perceived value is at least two times what they the have spending. to pay for. Uh, because if not, you know, if it's just 10%, they don't want to take the risk, You're particularly with a startup, right? Why change? Why go to something new if um, there's not an overwhelming feeling that, wow, this product's really going to be worth it to me uh, by at least, you know, a couple hundred percent. Uh, and so you got to get your value proposition, um, you know, aligned to that and your pricing strategy. Uh, aligned to that value proposition um, because you have to be able to convert customers to paying customers, you know, trial customers to paying customers. Uh, and you only do that if they see that strong value proposition. Um, you know, set this, the, the whole world of SaaS cloud, I was, I was at Oracle when we first got into the SaaS business, the software as a service business, uh, and helped build the infrastructure for all of that. Uh, today, it's their fastest growing, and it continues to be their largest, fastest growing part of their business. Um, but it can be dangerous for a startup because unlike if you buy a license uh, up front, you pay the full cost as a customer up front. But with a SaaS model, it takes a longer period of time to recover the capital. So you have to understand that time to break even for a customer uh, that comes into play because if it's too long, 
you're going to have working capital challenges, which are going to keep you from being able to get to that cash flow break even point uh, too far out in time. Uh, another marketing issue is head-to-head -head competition with the industry leaders. You, you don't want to be the David taking on the Goliath, if you would. Uh, you, you want to find a way to uh, either be very different than them, like my Uber example, uh, or take a tack where you're coming in and attacking from not a head-on competition, but from a peripheral one where you have the opportunity to uh, displace the larger industry player. Uh, and that's you know, yet another very important uh, marketing point. Uh, so you know, I've touched on the team issues. I've touched on you know, the market related issues. Um, and then I, now I'm gonna talk more about just general execution. But before I do, if you have any other comments or questions, uh, Dr. Agarwal, please, you know, chime in here. I just want to say that, yes, uh, what, uh, you know, these are very enriching uh, talk for my audience who are one of uh, entrepreneurs, startups, and business executives. Uh, they are definitely going to be benefited by this talk. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So please well, conclude with your uh, general execution uh, tips. Sure. Yeah, I, you know, as you can tell, I, I enjoy doing this type of thing because I'm at a point in my career and lifetime where I want to help others. And, you know, that to me, this kind of thing is a great way to be able to reach a broader audience and happy, happy to do that. So let me talk about execution because, you know, those first two are sort of setting the stage for now some of the, you know, the key things that when you get down to executing on the business, you have to get right or your probability of success are not going to be very high. Uh, the, the first one is just focus. Um, you know, the, many entrepreneurs feel that, well, if we do a very broad set of things and try many things simultaneously, you know, we're going to be successful with some of them. Well, uh, to some degree that makes sense, but the reality is you've got to optimize your resources. So you have to focus on the things where you're going to get the greatest ROI. Otherwise, you're going to run out of cash back to the principal reason a startup fails. They haven't spent the time to think each day, and, I, and I'm not exaggerating when I say each day about spend and what they're spending on relative to the ROI. Like you can spend too much on product development. You can spend too much on marketing. You got to get that right balance between the two to optimize getting the cash flow break even as soon as possible. And that typically requires a focus on a part of your offering that is going to bring the greatest success. You know, and, and I'll talk about, let me, let me talk maybe just briefly about some experience I had here as an investor. We had a company uh, that was trying to do a very broad horizontal strategy, which was basically bringing a framework product to market uh, that could be used in many industries. So, you know, their logic was, well, that's, you know, going to give us lots of different opportunities. But when we got them to focus on one industry, and it happened to be the insurance industry, um, that company ended up uh, helping IBM close a very large insurance deal, several hundred million dollars in size. Uh, and they focused on bringing knowledge in that vertical. The, the, the company is called, by the way, was called Webify. And it was helping that company, uh, helping companies when the internet first started formulating itself uh, to the internet. Uh, to bring uh, the ability to webify their solutions. So they had that broad offering. But then the realization was when they focused on a niche market, the industry, large, fast growing, but a focused market around insurance, they, built, they were able to develop lots of semantic knowledge around that into the workflow. And this is what attracted IBM to them as a partner. And ultimately, by the way, 
<laughs> six months after that contract, IBM acquired the company uh, because, you know, again, it was such a good fit for IBM and they saw mm -hmm. the synergistic value of owning that technology capability. And so it was a win-win all the way around. So again, a focus there was uh, the reason they were successful. So a vertical strategy versus a horizontal strategy was the takeaway there. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, companies that are not agile enough, uh, and, and this, is, this is one where the entrepreneur has to be careful because you don't wanna just willy nilly shift from one place to another. You need to have a feel for when the right time to pivot is if you're going to pivot or to shift your strategy somewhat based on what you're learning in the marketplace. But you don't want to do that so much that you're right back to the last point, not focused, right? So it's finding that balance between uh, understanding where the sweet spot of the market opportunity is while uh, staying agile enough to shift um, to, to be successful uh, in, in accomplishing that. Uh, and, you know, the reality is the data point here is the first business plan, you know, it's very rare that the, the business plan from the first stage startup is the same as when the company has grown to a large size or has had an exit. It's very rare. Uh, there's exactly. almost always shifts in successful companies. Thank you, Mark. I think uh, that was a great session today. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all your experience and expertise uh, on this platform. I am privileged and I am honored to have you here. So I'm happy, I will... to, happy to participate. Thank you.